Good morning. Can I just say a few words before the start of Ted Wilson's first lecture? Uh, first point, there will be, this lecture will go on every day of this week, and contrary to what was announced in the weekly bulletin in the grid, it's not at 11, but it's at 10 o'clock every day. So please don't mix it up, and it's two hours per day. Apart from this, you will find here uh, some questionnaire, and this does not concern the students, but it concerns the people who are at CERN. If you want copies of the lectures afterwards, please fill in the quest uh, the, your name in capital letters, and that Well, good morning, everybody. I trust you can all hear me at the back. Now, physicists, when they get old, are said to turn to red wine and to history. Now, I don't think, looking around the audience, that you're quite old enough for that, perhaps for the red wine, but not for the history. Nevertheless, I'm going to, this morning, insert in, in front of the academic training series an extra lecture, which is on the history of accelerators, and in particular, the synchrotron. This is because it turns out, looking at the history of the way machines have been designed and conceived, is a good way of explaining all the principles in a logical way. Here, of course, is a summary of the history of accelerators, starting from the early days, 1930, when circular machines and linear machines were first built. However, the history really started earlier than that. The history started over a hundred years ago when Röntgen invented the X-ray technique. There is one of his first pictures, of uh, X-ray pictures of a, a ring on someone's finger. In order to make the X-rays, of course, he had to bombard um, something with electrons, and he had an electron accelerator, which presumably was an electrostatic accelerator. This is a picture of his laboratory, and I have not been able to disentangle the various components. Perhaps I should read his original paper, but this looks very much like uh, uh, some sort of accelerator which, in which the electrons are being accelerated and hitting a target. That is over a hundred years ago. And of course, over a hundred years ago and in the years until 1920, uh, there were electrostatic high voltage machines available which would be capable of accelerating particles. If you only connected them to an anode, you could accelerate an electron with them. And that history of electrostatic uh, machines is summarized in this, this slide. Later on, in the 1930s, electrostatic machines uh, were used for crucial experiments in nuclear fission by Cockcroft and Walton. And this is their device called the Cockcroft-Walton uh, accelerator, which was basically a voltage multiplier diode system connected to a high-voltage terminal to accelerate particles. Even earlier than that, a man called Van de Graaff in, uh, invented a machine where charge was sprayed onto a, a moving belt and carried up to a high-voltage terminal where it accumulated and because of the capacitance of this terminal it produced a voltage between this terminal and ground. And those machines, there are still some of them around today. The idea of making particles go round in a circle uh, through an electrostatic potential was perhaps something which people considered, but they rejected upon it, rejected it, because if you succeed in accelerating a particle as you go from this terminal to that terminal, a plate, a hole in a plate to another hole in a plate, it loses the same amount of energy, again, 
as it goes around the rest of the ring because it sees all the fringe fields of this uh, electrostatic device opposing it as it comes out of the hole here. If you don't believe that and you believe Maxwell's equations, you might consider this formal proof that that is the case. <clears throat> that Maxwell's equation del cross E is equal to minus dB dt um, becomes in an integral form that the integral of the field around this circle that the particle passes around as it returns to the electrostatic accelerator is minus d by dt integral bs, the integral of the field, the time derivative of the integral of the field across here. So that if you have an electrostatic field, you have no time derivative, and there can be no net acceleration around here. <coughs> Conversely, of course, this tells you that you could use the time derivative of a field in order to accelerate particles in a, in a circle. And that was used very early on, or invented very early on, by a man called Widerö, who was a Norwegian. And in 1920-something, 23, 24, he, while he was working at university on his thesis, drew this diagram of an accelerator, as we know it today, a betatron. It was called a betatron because beta rays and alpha rays were the ways in which people described particles in those days. So this was a device for accelerating beta rays or electrons. And it, he invented it because he was pondering upon the idea of using, he, he knew that if you put a uh, an iron core here and a coil around it, you could induce a current to flow in a secondary of a transformer. And he asked himself, supposing we have a, a beam of electrons going around, not in a wire, but in a, a vacuum tube, will you be able to accelerate it? Will you be able to induce a current? I don't think he really thought of acceleration at that stage. And then he sat down and worked out and he came to the surprising conclusion that you could accelerate particles to quite high energies, a few tens of MeV, which was a lot of energy in those days. It was higher than you could accelerate with an electrostatic device before it broke down. And it was also much higher than the natural uh, energies of particles which came from radioactive decay, which had been used by Rutherford and others in those early days for experiments. And he went to his professor and said, I would like to build this machine as my thesis topic. And his professor said it will never work, which was a pity because later on in the 1930s, people made it work. And the idea was that you would uh, induce by the dBdt or the flux which is passing through this core here, you would cause particles to accelerate within this vacuum chamber or this annulus which is, it had to be placed in some sort of guide field to make the particles go round in a circle and that guide field was provided by yet another uh, um, electromagnet and it was important and Vidaro discovered this, it was important that the total flux inside this ring was twice the flux you would expect if there was a uniform field across this ring. And if you did that, the particles stayed at the same radius as they were accelerated. So it was a very clever device. It's a pity that he was discouraged from building it. And don't let you yourselves be discouraged by your professors from new ideas. You see, you can often miss something. Vidro turned to his, his imagination to other problems. There was a man called Ising who had invented a linear method of accelerating. He never built a linear accelerator, but by, he had the idea that if you put a series of drift tubes and apply voltages to them sequentially as a particle goes through, the voltage at each drift tube needn't be too high, uh, and you needn't worry about breakdown, but you could add the effect onto the energy of the particles. 
Now, Isaac hadn't even tried to make that work, but Diderot made a model which showed that it was possible. And he built, before 1930, the first linear accelerator. And here is his, his diagram of that device. And it consisted of only one drift tube, which was driven by an oscillator, an RF oscillator, and a grounded plate here and a grounded drift tube here. So that particles as they came in here, I think they were sodium ions, because they, had the, they were nice and slow and you could, the, the RF, the radio frequencies that were available then were rather low frequencies. They passed first of all through this gap and by the time they reached the next gap, the voltage had swung round to the other polarity so that they were still accelerated towards, the, um, towards this um, uh, grounded plate. And then they fell on some screen so that he could see from the deflection produced by this uh, electrostatic deflector what energy they had. And he was able to complete his thesis with that and invent the linear accelerator. Linear accelerators only became really popular as accelerators once the uh, radar techniques of the Second World War had developed high power radio transmitters which could be used to make um, to, to inject radio waves, electromagnetic waves at high frequency into a, a resonant tube like this. This is a linear accelerator uh, as designed by Alvarez in which the particles start here and they pass through a series of drift tubes. Each time they pass through a drift tube they get extra acceleration from the voltage potential difference between the ends of the drift tubes excited by the radio frequency in this cavity. That principle is the principle of the linear accelerators which we still use today as pre-injectors for our big machines at CERN. Linear accelerators can take other forms. They can be quite simple resonant cavities like this in which the drift tubes have become simple holes in diaphragms like this and you pump in uh, radio waves at one end and, but the principle is the same that the phase of the field seen by the particle keeps in step with its motion. As I said, it took some time for the LINAC to be practical as a, a device for high energy within a, a short distance. And meanwhile, another of the innovators of accelerators, Ernest Lawrence, actually reading of Vidaro's uh, discovery of the LINAC, was prompted to invent the cytotron. All of this happened in a very productive and fertile uh, period around about 1930, 29, 30, 31. He invented the cyclotron. Here's a picture of the cyclotron, which I showed some of you yesterday. And you can see it consists of two halves of a uh, biscuit tin that's been shut in, cut in half, uh, two Ds, which are excited by radio frequency. And these are the accelerating gaps. The particles are held inside this uh, magnetic, this, these Ds, by a magnetic field, which is vertical. And it has the nice property, the very nice property, that uh, as the uh, particle spirals out, its revolution frequency is constant. Now, I will be saying something uh, in the next talk about magnetic rigidity, and I may come back to this slide and explain how that is. But uh, there is a, obviously the particle becomes uh, orbit becomes stiffer, it has a higher magnetic rigidity as it is accelerated and that just ensures that there is a constant revolution frequency in the cyclotron. Here is the first. First of all there was a, a I think he built a model, but this is the first, one of the first cyclotrons built by Lawrence in California. And these were very successful experiments, both uh, machines for accelerating particles, not only for particle physics, 
nuclear physics as it was then, but also for medicine, for uh, making, uh, irradiating people. I think Lawrence irra irradiated his mother-in-law. Uh, I don't think she was improved by that, but uh, he thought it was all a good intention he had. Anyway, she was very rich and gave him some more money for his cyclotrons. The cyclotron had um, a problem that it had no focusing, at least at the beginning it had no focusing, and particles in the gap of the, focus, of the cyclotron would wander as vertically to hit the poles. But a man called Macmillan discovered that if you um, shimmed, put in shims here in the gap between the pole piece and the pole to increase the field and enhance this uh, spherical curvature of the field at the end, you could produce some focusing. He didn't know it was focusing. He, he was just doing a, an experiment to see what shims did. In fact, I think he got it the wrong way round because he was trying to make the field stronger at the edge to keep the particles in. But for some reason, he put them in the middle and um, he found that the intensity increased. And the focusing is a very important principle of accelerators. It is by finding cleverer focusing systems that we often can make technological breakthroughs in, or breaks through, if, I suppose, if you're correct in English, in, into fields where we can build bigger and uh, more uh, impressive accelerators. And this was the first discovery of transverse focusing. The reason it happens is because in this region here, the field is not vertical, purely vertical, but there is a horizontal component, a radial component of the field associated with the fact that these lines are curved. The radial component of the field, if you do your left hand, right hand rule, you know, is it the left hand or the right hand? I don't know. F uh, physicists always have difficulty remembering whether to use their right or the left hand, and they ask engineers which it should be. So uh, I won't, uh, since I'm a physicist, I won't attempt to tell you which it is. But whichever it is will tell you that if you have a horizontal field and a particle going into this slide, it will be deflected vertically. And if you have the, uh, it, it's in such a direction that the particle is restored and pushed downwards above the medium plane here, or the middle plane, and pushed upwards if it's below the middle plane. So that provides some natural restoring force or focusing. We'll come to focusing later. The other difficulty that cyclotrons had was due to the fact that relativity, as you approach the the relativistic regime, the velocity of the particle, instead of increasing classically in the relation that the energy is e mv squared over 2, follows a different law. In fact, the velocity, as you increase the energy, saturates, just as uh, a magnet might saturate, and, uh, and only goes asymptotically to the velocity of light. We come back to that in the second lecture. But the effect was that it destroyed this uh, constancy of magnetic, of, of uh, revolution frequency in the cyclotron. You remember that I showed you this rather briefly, this slide which extolled the virtue of the cyclotron that it has constant revolution frequency. This mathematics depends upon working in this classical regime. It breaks down when the velocity becomes constant. Obviously, the particle doesn't go as fast as you expect as you increase its energy, and the revolution frequency sags. And so they, uh, what happened was that particles would get out of step with their accelerating field as they reached the edge of the cyclotron, above a certain energy, and it proved impossible to build cyclotrons of much more than 30 MeV. But then people had the idea, why not change the frequency, tune the frequency, so that uh, you, first of all, inject some particles into the cyclotron, and then as they're accelerated, you reduce the, well, with some sort of variable capacitor, you reduce the frequency of the RF that you feed into the accelerating system. 
And this was the first idea of a, not a continuous beam, but a, a pulsed beam in which you inject particles. And as you inject particles, as their energy rises, to, as they move outwards in radius, then you change the frequency. Now, there was one difficulty that people had in, in building such a machine. One reason why they hadn't the courage to do that was that they thought that there was no mechanism equivalent to the focusing mechanism, transversely, which would act in order to make sure that particles still kept synchronous with this radio frequency. If the radio frequency hadn't been tuned to exactly the right program, how would particles still stay, arrive at exactly the right time at the, the Ds, as they were called, or the gaps in the Ds? And that was solved by a, a fundamental discovery, which was one of the cornerstones of building accelerators, called the discovery of phase stability. And here is, uh, I'll come to phase stability later on, but this is the, um, um, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the principle of, of phase stability. And here we have uh, its discovery, its discoverer, Macmillan, the same man that discovered the focusing principle, and he's explaining it here uh, to a rather distrustful Lawrence, who was the man who invented the cyclotron. And uh, we, unfortunately, Lawrence is standing in front of his formula. We can only see an omega there. But I will be giving you more formulae later in this afternoon, in this the second lecture, which will explain that principle of phase stability. It was crucial in order to uh, make not only the synchrocyclotron work, but also the synchrotron. Now, while people were using cyclotrons to, to accelerate ions and protons, and by this time they were building betatrons in order to uh, accelerate electrons, uh, it was during the war. And many of the uh, accelerator builders had turned their hand uh, to the, the, the efforts to separate uranium. There was a big effort in the United States at that time to build uranium separation plants. And one of these people, an Englishman, or an Australian actually, I should call him, you know, called Oliphant, was over at, um, in the States and he was minding the separation plant on the night shifts, as many of you know how boring it can be on night shifts. And he had time to think. And he wondered, he said, now uh, that we have this synchrotron, this uh, principle of phase stability, cannot we also not only change the frequency, but change the field at the same time? Supposing we build a ring which is a cyclotron, but we only use the outer rim of it, just the, the edge of the pole. And we inject particles into that edge of the pole at a very low magnetic field. And as they are accelerated through going through some sort of modified D system, uh, we increase the field to keep pace with the... Uh, uh, increasing energy so that they stay, have the same magnetic rigidity. Magnetic rigidity is proportional to energy or strictly momentum. And at the same time we change the frequency, not by this slight amount that we had before, but, but rather radically because the particles are going faster at the same radius. And we invent a machine and this machine he called a synchrotron because I'm not sure why he called it a synchrotron, or perhaps uh, it was a misnomer, but that name has stuck. I suppose it synchronizes the rise in field with the rise in energy of the particles. It synchronizes the change in frequency with that. And Oliphant um, published his idea, and people started to uh, try to build synchrotrons. And there was a bit of a race going on. The people that, that uh, won the race were working in the 
in Britain, actually, and they converted an old Betatron, this is it, which had actually been bought for X-raying unexploded bombs in the streets of London. In those days, there were quite a number of unexploded bombs in the streets of London, and they had ordered this Betatron from the United States in order to, um, to, to do this. And here's the Betatron, and you remember the Betatron looks a bit like a synchrotron. It has a, a ring, magnet, and so on, and they modified that. They put inside uh, an, a radio frequency accelerating system to boost the natural uh, DBDT effect of the, of the Betatron. And here it is. And um, on the other side of the Atlantic, while they were doing this, and they succeeded in just raising the energy slightly. Let me show you this slide. But it, it is actually the first time that people built a synchrotron. There we are. And you can see that this is very... This is one trace without acceleration. And uh, you can see that there is acceleration ends here. In this trace, it goes on a little bit further. It's explained here. This was due to the effect of putting radio frequency on this rather rudimentary RF cavity, radio frequency cavity, which they inserted into the Betatron. On the other side of the Atlantic, people built a more professional machine, which was a, a synchrotron, the first electron synchrotron at uh, General Electric. And this came on the air just slightly after that. And you can see here that this photograph shows synchrotron light emerging from this electron synchrotron for the first time. People were rather surprised at that. They didn't really expect the synchrotron light to come out um, <clears throat> at that frequency or to be visible. So they were rather surprised to find this uh, synchrotron light coming out. And of course, synchrotron light is used not for high physics these days, but in a, num a large number of machines built specifically to produce synchrotron light uh, nowadays. Electron machines for research and also for industrial uses, like ESRF at Grenoble. Now, I said that the frequency in the field had to be programmed in these machines. Of course, people went on from electron machines to plan proton machines, because proton machines uh, were, more e were easier to build, or so they thought. But there was the problem of building machines in which this program was followed. You can see how complicated it was. The magnetic field doesn't rise in a synchrotron linearly, and all sorts of kinks and so on have to be put in the program, which changes the, the frequency of the, of the, um, and the magnetic field in the synchrotron. But those technological problems were overcome. And you can see here an example of, of a synchrotron. This is a synchrotron at Birmingham, which was the, built by Oliphant, the inventor of the synchrotron. But unfortunately, it was not the latest one, the first one to be built. He had to build it with um, student labor because the government was not uh, very forthcoming in funds. And uh, he had his graduate students um, stacking all these laminations to make this huge circular magnet and, 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 and putting this vacuum chamber in the gap between the poles. And this is the RF system, the thing that replaced the, the Ds of a, of, a, of a cyclotron. And you can see someone here, he's either listening to the football results or tuning up the, the accelerator, I'm not quite sure what but he's got his earphones on. Um, the first proton synchrotron to work was uh, at, at Brookhaven, or the first big one. Yes, the first big one, first one, at, called Cosmotron. Although it says Chicago here, they're the people that made it. This is an advertisement they put in their, their house journal. And you can see here the ring magnet 
and you can see people here, I don't know exactly what they think they're doing, but they're assembling something. I think they're putting in the, the coil, which is around here, or adjusting it, or putting in something which is part of the assembly of this machine. This was the first synchrotron which had gaps in it, like this, in order to put in the radio frequency and in to inject and so on. These machines were weak focusing machines. They used the principle, the same principle as the uh, cyclotron to focus particles vertically and horizontally. They had a slight gradient on the magnetic field as you went outwards towards the outside of the, of the, uh, of the magnet, which provided this focusing. And no one could really find a way of overcoming this. It meant that particles oscillated by large distances as they went round the ring, and it made the magnet very large. The aperture of these magnets, one calculation said that it had to be four feet, once that, I don't know what that is, four feet, about this much, by this much high for this machine. Fortunately, they hadn't enough money to, to build it that big, and they built it a bit bigger, and even more fortunately, it worked. But no one found a way of making this aperture smaller, and yet they could not really envisage building bigger machines than this until they'd found such a method. Already this machine had as much steel in it as a, uh, a fair-sized battleship, and to make something of ten times the energy was inconceivable at that time. Now, they couldn't increase this gradient which was doing the focusing because Although it focused vertically, it had a, a defocusing effect horizontally. And this uh, tended to, uh, if, you, if you made the, the focusing too strong, you destroyed, you might increase the vertical focusing, the defocusing uh, was destroyed and it, it, performance didn't improve. This happened anyway at a certain energy in this cosmotron as the magnet saturated the outer bits of the pole became less effective and the field gradient got bigger. And various people, the Cosmotron team, were trying to find ways around this. Here are some of them. This is Ernest Current up here and uh, oh, other people. And this chap, Christophilus, is important as well. Uh, Ernest Current was sent away by his boss, who I think was this guy, to think about some solution to the problem of bolstering up the field at the edge of here, which was stopping them getting to higher energy. And he had the idea of reversing some of the yokes, because if you reverse the yoke, the magnet tends to saturate in the middle. And so he, I don't think they had computers in those days, but they did calculations with these machines that you turn handles, and he went away for a few weeks and calculated what would affect what would be the effect of reversing some of the return yokes of the Cosmotron magnet. And he came back very excited one day to tell his boss that the more of the yokes he, he reversed, the better the focusing was. And people began to think about this. And in fact, this guy who was a, a theorist, and you know theorists are always very good at explaining things afterwards. You notice that? It's always afterwards that they tell you that if you'd only come to them, they would have told you that that was, that was elementary. So Snyder said, well, uh, Ernest, uh, if you'd come to me, I'd have told you there is a very simple optical system which is, has alternating focusing, which is well known in optics. Here it is. It's called, you put a focusing lens and a defocusing lens, one after the other, equal power, and it has a very strong net focusing system if you get the spacing right. And what you're doing with your magnets is reversing the, the polarity of this or the sign of this, this field gradient, and you're doing exactly the same as that. And he drew diagrams which look like this and which I'll show you later on in the next lecture where you can ponder over which show that there are rays which go through alternating sets of focusing and defocusing magnets which, are, which produce a strong focusing effect. And this would enable them to reduce the size of the vacuum chamber from something which was this big to something which was this big. And they were planning a new machine, and just about that time, 
CERN had been created, that was 1953, and these people, this is a team from CERN actually, one of these is, is Vidaro, uh, I, think, I think it's this guy here, came over to find out how these machines should be built because they'd never built anything like the Cosmotron before and they were planning to build a 10 GeV version of the 3 GeV Cosmotron. And uh, as a first example in uh, US-European collaboration on the accelerator building, the Cosmotron people said, we've just discovered this important strong focusing system uh, principle. And they shared it with the Europeans. The Europeans went back and immediately decided that the machine which sits over here between this place and the Tortella restaurant, the PS, would be built using this principle although it had never been tried before. And this would enable them to build a vacuum chamber which was much smaller, to go to a much higher energy. Instead of 10 GeV, they'd go to 25 or even 30 GeV. And, and so this strong focusing principle was put into practice at the PS. And here's an early drawing of the, of the PS, the 25 GeV proton synchrotron goes to slightly more than 25 GV, but at that stage they went to 25 GV. And you can see the idea that these magnets now, there's a whole string of them around a 100 meter radius circle. And uh, in the old days there was a simple linear accelerator which injected into the, into the machine and beams came out and are extracted into an area which is now called the south area. And the, the idea, of course, is that the particles are injected at low energy, they're accelerated, the field rises, there are radio frequency cavities here, quite a small proportion of the ring, which are tuned to keep their frequency in, in step with the rising field, and that is, that is the first modern alternating gradient synchrotron, still working here. The next big step, of course, was to build, at least here, uh, there was a, the next big step was to finish the, uh, the AGS, I should say, because I know there are some Americans in the audience and they're very proud of the fact that they too, at the same time as we were building the PS, they built the AGS at Brookhaven and those two machines came on the air. I must admit that we had beam before they did, but they had experiments running before us, so about the same time. Uh, the next big machine leap in energy was the Fermilab main ring, which was, went uh, an order of magnitude and more higher in energy, built at Chicago. And then because of political problems, we could not equal that for about five years, but eventually we built the, the SPS here, which is still running and which some of you may have seen already. And this is uh, a modern, warm, as, it can, as distinct from superconducting synchrotron. You can see here the elements of that. These are, these are now the, uh, the devices which provide the gradient, the focusing gradient. They're called quadrupoles, and I will say something more about those in the next lecture. And these are the bending magnets, the red devices here. And then you don't see it on this picture, but the radio frequency cavities which do the acceleration are but a small fraction of this huge six kilometer circumference. And of course now we're build, beginning to build the LHC, which is uh, even bigger than this. It's in the left tunnel, another proton machine, another proton synchrotron. And uh, by increasing the field by roughly a factor of five over in the bending magnets by using superconducting magnets and increasing the, the circumference using the lap tunnel, that machine, of course, will have a, an even higher energy. So that completes my historical review of mainly of synchrotrons, but also I've mentioned the earlier machines. I hope that along the way you will have seen some of the principles. Let, let's just think of them. There is the idea of acceleration which must be provided by something. It must be either the rising magnetic field 
as it is in the beta tron, or the gap between uh, drift tubes in a linear accelerator, or the uh, gap between the Ds, or a, a cavity, a radio frequency cavity as it is in a modern synchrotron, specifically designed to accelerate. If you have a circular machine, you must have a guide field, which brings particles back to the cavities again for another dose of acceleration. Circular machines, as we see from the first synchrotron, radiate synchrotron radiation. At least they do with electrons. And that, uh, until now, has not been a problem too much with protons. But as we go to higher energy with proton synchrotrons, it's becoming a problem that uh, in LHC there would be quite a lot of synchrotron radiation radiated by the protons, although they're heavier and less prone to radiate synchrotron radiation. And the next machine after the, uh, after the LHC will almost certainly be a linear collider in which we don't try and bend particles around in a circle in a synchrotron anymore. We try to collide to the beams from two Linux together. I haven't said anything about colliders, but I'm sure you're aware that uh, in recent years people have realized that they can get much more energy in the center of mass of colliding two particles head on than colliding particles from an accelerator with a stationary target. And all modern high energy physics, I think almost without exception, is nowadays done by colliding either two beams from two counter-rotating accelerators or if they're particles and antiprotons, particles and antiparticles, in, as they are in LEP or as they were in the antiproton project here, colliding them in the same ring. I think that uh, ends uh, my first lecture as an introduction to the history of accelerators. Thank you very much.